got your Bible, turn to the book of Joshua, chapter number one. The book of Joshua, chapter number one. <clears throat> Joshua, chapter number one. We're going to read verse one through verse number nine. So let's get it in the Lord's house again tonight. Joshua, chapter one, <clears throat> verse number one. Now after the death of Moses, the servants of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan. Thou and all this people unto the land which I do give them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your feet shall tread upon, that I have given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness of this Lebanon, even to the great river, River Euphrates, and all the land of the Hittites, and then unto the great sea toward that the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I'll be with thee. I'll not fail thee nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or the left that thou mayest prosper wheresoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, wheresoever thou goest. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the, <clears throat> pass through the host, and commanded the people, saying, Prepare ye victuals, for within three days ye shall pass over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God giveth you. Possess it. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we come before you once again to thank you for this another opportunity. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for mercy and grace. And I pray you'd help us tonight, dear Lord, as we get into your word. I pray, Lord, you'd bless the reading of it. And I pray you'd bless the preaching tonight. Dear God, I need your help. I pray you'd be with us. Uh, move everything out of our mind that shouldn't be there and help us, dear Lord, to concentrate, Lord, on these scriptures for a few minutes tonight. I pray you'd bless each one that's here. Touch all the objects that's been mentioned here in this church today, all those that may be sick. I pray you'd move up on them. Touch the ones that couldn't be here tonight, dear Lord, and I pray you'd bless them. And what is thank you for that you've done for us, because in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> we just read the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verse number 1 through verse number 11. And as the book of Joshua begins, we begin to find a new setting taking place after the book of Deuteronomy closes out. We find a new leader coming up on the scene here in the book of Joshua. As Deuteronomy closes, you know, we see the great leader Moses, and we see Moses' death at the, book, at the end of the book of Deuteronomy. And you know, when Moses had been Israel's leader, I mean, for many years, he was a man they looked up to, a man they loved. But you remember one time Moses rebelled against God, and God wouldn't allow Moses to go over into Canaan land. He was going to allow him to look over into the promised land, but he wasn't going to let him go. And, you know, God let Moses look. Then Moses died, you'll find there in the book, end of the book of Deuteronomy. And you know, God already had a plan before Moses ever died. God already had this man with the name of Joshua picked out, already had him chosen to step in and become the leader of the nation of Israel. You can find that in the book of Numbers, chapter number 27. He already had him chose out, but also in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 34, verse number 9. And you know, Joshua took the place of God's servant according to the Bible. You'll find in Deuteronomy 34, 5 in Joshua chapter 1 and verse number 2, he was called servant of the Lord. And in the book of Joshua, Moses was called my servant. You know, you stop and think about that. I mean, God called Moses the servant of the Lord and my servant. You know, Joshua was going to have some big shoes to fill when he stepped in when this man Moses died. 
You know, God, God knows what's going to happen from one day to the next. God knew before Moses was ever born that he was going to have to have a Joshua to step in when it was time for Moses to go off the scene. You know, Moses was their great leader. Joshua had to take him place. Moses was their hero. You remember Moses or, was the man that led them out of bondage. Led them out of the Egypt down there. They'd been in there 400 years as slaves. Led them out across the Red Sea. But God wasn't going to let him go much farther because he rebelled one time. You know, you can do one thing in your life and it can cost you. And it cost Moses. He never got to go into the promised land. Now, I know there was times they murmured against Moses. The children of Israel did. But you can find in Deuteronomy chapter 34, they mourned when he died. And here now Joshua steps on the scene. How do you think Joshua felt after Moses died? You know, he was going to have some big shoes to step into. Big shoes to fill. If he's like most people with this human nature and this flesh, I'd say Joshua was probably a little bit nervous when he was going to have to step in. I know Joshua was a wise military man. He was a good leader. But he was still a fleshly man. He had to be a little nervous probably. Probably a little bit worried about how the people were going to accept him. Had big shoes to fill. And Joshua knew they was going to a land they'd never been to before. Going away they'd never been. Going to a place that they'd never been. And Joshua already knew there was going to be a number of enemies to fight when they crossed Jordan. Now well, Joshua was getting ready to face something that he'd never faced in his life. And I kind of give you a little bit of an introduction there to get us to where we're at. Now, you remember in Joshua chapter 1, the Lord told Joshua to go over Jordan. And when Joshua was crossing Jordan, that was going to mean something. That was going to, in a sense, it meant death to self. Their old life was gone. When they crossed over Jordan, they was going to Canaan land. They were going to the place they had been looking for. They didn't need to look back. They got in trouble in the wilderness when they started looking back. They started thinking about the things they even had when they was in bondage, thought they was going to be better off. But when they crossed Jordan, it was going to mean death to self. And you say, well, what was on the other side of Jordan? A lot of people, when you hear them preach and teach on this, and they get to talking about Canaan land, they'll try to tell you Canaan's a picture and type of hell. Canaan land, as we're going to look here tonight, it's not a picture of, or a type of heaven. Canaan land's a picture of the victorious Christian life. You say, well, why couldn't Canaan be a picture of heaven? Man, when once they crossed over into Canaan land, there was going to be enemies to fight. There ain't going to be nobody to fight in heaven. There's going to be peace once we get there with Jesus. Once they cross Canaan land, people are still going to die in Canaan land. People are still going to get sick. We go to heaven, nobody's going to die, nobody's going to get sick. When they got into Canaan land, people could leave there, they could be ejected from Canaan land. You go to heaven, you ain't going to be ejected, you don't want to leave there. Once we get there, it's going to be the greatest place we've ever been. But as we study the book here a little while tonight, book of Joshua chapter number 1, and you study the whole book of Joshua and read in the book of Joshua, it teaches us a lot about the Christian life and you can compare it a lot to the book of Ephesians where you get over into the New Testament studying out the book of Ephesians. But I want to talk to you a little while tonight on how to live that victorious Christian life. I mean, these folks were getting ready to have to do something they'd never done. Joshua was going to have to do things he'd never done. The children of Israel was. But the Lord gives them some instructions here in Joshua chapter 1. Once they get over Canaan land, how they can how they can live this Christian life and be victorious in it. You know, we don't have to live a defeated life every day. You ever seen a time we've got so many defeated Christians? We walk into the house of God not happy. We walk into the house of God down and out. We do it all week long. Man, we ought to be able to try to cross Jordan every once in a while and get over into Canaan land. I want to show you some things here in Joshua chapter 1. That we've got to have tonight to live this victorious Christian life. I want you to notice down in verse number 5 what the Lord told Joshua here. The Bible said there shall not be, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I'll be with thee. I'll not fail thee nor forsake thee. 
I want you to notice if we ever cross over to Jordan, ever cross into Canaan, and we live this Christian life, living in a victorious manner, we've got to have a helper tonight. You know, we're real good at trying to do things on our own. You know, I'm the worst in the world. I'll try to do everything in the world I can get by with before I ever ask God to help me. You know, we're stubborn and we're selfish. And there's things in this world we ought to try to accomplish. But then we ought to put God in everything we do. He told Joshua there in verse number 5, he said, As I was with Moses, so I'll be with thee. We've got to have a helper in this life. And this helper we've got is Christ. He looked at Joshua and said, I'll be with you just like I was with Moses. He said, I know there's going to be a number of enemies to fight. You're going to face things you've never faced. He said, but don't worry about it. I'll be with you just like I was with Moses. You know, I believe he may even want, could, old Joshua could think back what's he talking about. Hey, God was with Moses when he brought him out of Egypt. God was with Moses when he stretched that rod out over the Red Sea. Man, God was with Moses when he went up on the mountain and got the commandments and could even come back down in that crowd and went wild on him. God was telling Joshua, he said, Joshua, it's going to be all right. I'm going to be with you. Hebrews 13, 5, the Bible said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now, Joshua had God with him. Moses had God with him. And you know, if we ever live this victorious Christian life, we've got to have the same thing to be successful. We've got to have God. And I believe we're living in a day and time right now. We need God more than we ever have. You ever seen a time that we throw God out of more things coming and going? Everywhere you look, every time you cut the news on, they throw God out of something else. They're trying to throw Him out of a school. And we need to throw Him out of most of our homes anymore if we'd be honest. I mean, Joshua is going to have God with him. You know, we've tried to do it on our own too much anymore. You know, that's why we're failing in our Christian lives. You know, we, we need God and Him alone. There's no other name above His today. You know, we're looking for help in all the wrong places. Something goes wrong, we run to Raleigh. Something goes wrong, we run to the State House. We run to the White House. Man, what's wrong with what Joshua had? He had the most powerful general anywhere in God behind him when he went to battle. He said, Joshua, I'm going to be with you. And you know, if we realize if we're saved tonight, we've got to let Christ lead us. You said, well, how do we let him do that? That takes faith is what it takes. Bible said in verse number 5, I'll be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Now when he said I'll not fail, you'll find nowhere in this Bible that God ever failed in anything. He's always been a success tonight. There's never been a battle that he ever lost. So there was never a case too hard for him. I mean he said, Joshua, I'm going to be with you. You know that's a blessing tonight. We've got a friend that will stick closer than a brother. You know I believe Joshua had that kind of faith. And you know, you can't live this life without a help. I mean, we ought to stop tonight and just look at our own lives personally. Are we really letting God guide us, letting Him lead us? You know what the Holy Ghost's job was when Jesus went back to heaven when He sent that comforter? To lead, guide, and direct us is what the Holy Ghost's job is. Now, we can come to the house of God and we try to do it a lot of times on our own without the Holy Ghost. No help in it. We'll get up and sing a lot of times. No help, no power behind it. We'll get up to preach a lot of times. But without God, it's going to come to nothing. I mean, there's a real blessing right there in verse number 5. He said, There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Now that's a promise that he made to Joshua. You know, I believe we can stand on every promise that's ever been made in this Bible. He says one thing in one place, it won't contradict itself somewhere else in this book. So we've got the same God that Joshua had. You know, we've got to have Him tonight. We've got to have Him as our help. I want you to notice a few other things He told Joshua that He needed to do once He crossed over this Jordan. You look also in verse number 6. He's still giving him some instructions here. The Bible said, Be strong and of good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give thee. He's told Joshua he's got to have a helper. He's got to have God in verse number 5. Then he said, Joshua, you've got to be strong. And you know, when we look at that word strong most of the time, we're, we're thinking about physical strength. 
We talk about strong. We'll look at these young boys and wonder how much they can lift or how much work they can do before they ever wear out. We'll say they're strong. But he told Joshua, said, be strong. And I believe he's talking about maybe several different things here when he says be strong. That word strong means possessing great moral, spiritual, or physical power. I wonder if God may have been said, Joshua, you're going to have to be strong spiritually one thing. <coughs> You know, Joshua was going to have to be strong spiritually. He had all these millions of Jews out there all the time belly aching. You, you know, we think it's bad sometimes pastoring uh, 25 or 30 Baptists. You think about Moses and Joshua, all these million Jews that were leading and all the time belly aching. Man, they had to be spiritually strong. They had to have a self-control or they'd have flew off on that bunch all the time. I mean, you think he, I believe he was saying you got to be spiritually strong. I believe he was telling him also you're going to have to be strong biblically. And you're going to have to be strong praying, Joshua. You know, I believe that's some of our weakest points tonight, being strong biblically. And being strong strong in praying in our prayer lives. You know, we, we get real weak praying, seems like, anymore. Used to, folks would take time out to pray. Churches used to have, a lot of times they'd have a night a week or a Saturday night they'd meet out to pray. Churches used to, I've heard them talk about having all night prayer meetings for lost people. Men and women used to get out in the woods and tell me back years ago and pray for hours over lost people, pray over the country. Seems like now the only time we want to pray is when we're getting ready to go to war or we've got a big natural disaster. You know, prayer is the key to being strong spiritually. You know what prayer is simply not? It's just talking to God. You know, we ought to get down and talk to Him just like we're talking to our Father. We'll get down and pray and we want to use big words that we never even think about until we get down and pray. We ought to get down and just simply talk to Him. But I remember it's been 10, 15 years back. My pastor's dead in heaven and I brother Frank Phillips. But I remember one night we was in a revival meeting and there was some things going on in the church. And I was down in the altar beside him. And it, it something struck me that night, man, and helped me pray. I heard him get down praying. He said, it's me, Frank, when he got down. That's all he said. But this some something said, God, this is me, Frank. That's the way we ought to talk to God. Well, I mean, we ought to have reverence when we get down. We ought to reverence him. He's holy. But we need to get down right where we're at to simply talk to him. Tell him our troubles. Tell him our problems. I mean, I believe Joshua was going to have to pray. Now notice what, what, what he was told here. He said to be strong. But you look in verse number 8. Here's where these strength will come from. It said, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Now I know they was living under the law back then. They had the commandments. I know we live under grace now. I mean, nobody can live under the law. The law was a good thing. The Bible said it was our schoolmaster. But there's not ever, never been but one who could keep it, and that was Jesus Christ. But he, and the Bible said there, not let that law depart out of the mouth. You think about what we've got right here tonight. We've got God's holy word. And we ought to never let God's holy word depart out of our mouth. It ought to be in our mind constantly, God's word. You know, God's Word is something that will make you strong. Yeah, it's something, I mean, it will help you get through the, the problems when they pop up when you least expect it. He told him also there in verse number 8, he said, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. He said, Joshua, meditate on this thing. And he's simply telling Joshua, he said, think about these things. Chew on them. You know, we, when we leave here tonight, we ought to hope I can give you something you can think about. I hope I can give you something you can chew on this week. He, he told Joshua, said, meditate on this. Think about it. You know, we can think about God's Word even when we're working during the week. We can keep it in our minds. I mean, we ought to keep this, this Word as close as we can keep to our... There ought to not be nothing any more precious in your house than this Bible. I mean, this is the most precious thing we've got. It's a living book. It's a life. It never changes. I mean, it's the best-selling book it's ever been in the Bible. But it's probably the least read book we have anywhere in this world in the day and time we live in this Bible. He said, Joshua, don't let these words depart out of your mouth. He said, meditate upon it. 
And he goes also there in that, in that same scripture and said, There day and night that thou mayest observe to do, do according to all that is written therein. There's one little bitty word right in the middle of that. It said, observe to do according to all. When you see that word all, it's nothing left out. It said all. Now we're good at trying to pick bits and pieces out of this Bible and fit them into our lives where we can fit them in. But God said, Joshua, you're going to have to do exactly what this law says, all of it. He was their leader. He said, you're going to have to live clean. You're going to have to live holy. You're going to have to live righteous before these people or they'll never follow you. And you know, we need to try to do that in our Christian life daily. That's how that we can live victorious if we do what this Bible says. Now, you know, we got a lot of folks that are double-minded. The Bible says a double-minded man's unstable in all his ways. All his ways. Now, if somebody that's unstable, you can't trust them. And a double-minded man is somebody that will walk up to me and say something and walk back here to one of these other men and say something else just exactly the opposite. They'll look at one way, one thing one way around somebody else and be totally different around somebody. They're, I mean, they're hypocrites is what they are. And so a double-minded man was unstable. You, you better be careful who you trade with. I mean, you think about double-minded men, unstable. I'm talking about don't trust them. You better not let anybody have an office in your church that's double-minded like that. You know, you better put folks in your church offices, man, you can trust people that are saved, people that will stay in this book, people that live clean. Bible tells us also there over in 2 Timothy 2.15, it said, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He said study. Now, when we talk about study, we think that's only for the preachers and teachers and deacons in the church. We're all to study this Bible. He said study to show thyself approved. That's what God expects out of me and you. That's what he accepts is us studying this. You say, well, how, how do we get strong? We've got to study God's word to gain strength. He even said in one place to pray without ceasing. And then I know we can't pray 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but we, we can keep as, as much of God in our mind as we can and try to, try to pray as often as we can. He said, do it without stopping. God needs strong people, not weak people. And you know, we need some Joshua's in the day and time we're living in. Man, these men in the Bible, we, we've heard about them, read about them, heard the stories. But if we could really see what these men went through, how they had to fight the battles, Man, they had to have some help. They had to be strong spirits. I want you to notice something else. Back up in verse number 6. Something else that Joshua was told he was going to have to have. The Bible said, be strong and of good courage. He's done told him he's going to have to be strong. Told him he's going to have to observe this book. He was going to have to live it. But then he said, you're going to have to have some courage, Joshua. Joshua had God, he was strong, and he had courage. Now that word courage, if you look it up in most Bible dictionaries, it'll say fearlessness in the face of danger. We mentioned earlier, Joshua was a, was a military leader. He was a wise military leader. And you know, these men in the military, they've got to have some courage. You go into battle, you're going to have to have some courage. You're, you're going to have to have a backbone if you're going to fight. And when these men went into battle, man, they, they went in. I mean, there was folks killed there in these times. You go to war, it's either you or somebody else. He told him he was going to have to be have courage. He was going to have to be courageous. And you know, the things Joshua had done as a military leader, he had to have courage. He used his head. He was smart. You'll study in the book of Joshua and other places how that Joshua always fight. Joshua was a man that would go right to the center of the land to fight. He'd cut the north off from the south. I mean, he was smart. He'd go right in between. He, you'll, you'll find in other places in, in Joshua chapter 8 how he used ambushes. How, how he put men in behind people and in front of them and different things and ambushed people at different times. I mean, he was wise the way he fought. You, you know, he was tricky as he, as he would go into battle. You know, the Christian life 
is like that a lot of times. It's a battle. Now, you know the Christian life's the best life. But when you get saved, man, it opens the door to a lot of trouble a lot of times. And I'm not trying to discourage anybody. Once you get saved, the devil's going to start attacking. When, you're a lot, when a person's lost, the devil's done got them. He don't mess with them much. But when you get saved, he goes to messing with your mind. He'll try to do everything in the world to get you to stay at the house when it's church time. He'll, he'll try for you to make every excuse in the world when it's time to study. I mean, the devil's somebody that, you know, we, we, we become real friendly with, seems like. I mean, the Bible tells us over there he's an angel of light. He'll disguise himself. He'll make things look real good to us sometimes. But you know, the longer you live, the devil's going to fight you harder. When you live this Christian life. But I believe we're living in a day and time. We've got real casual with the devil. We've got real friendly with him. You know we've got casual to the devil's devices. Man he's got things all around us. That we've got used to. And we don't think the devil has anything to do with them. You know the devil probably comes to the house of God. More than anybody does. Man he'll come in and sit right down beside us. And it don't bother us one bit. And you know, the devil is the chief opponent of God and the saved people. And you know, it takes courage to resist the devil. You know, you want a victorious life and you want to cross over into Jordan and cross over into Canaan, we've got to resist the devil. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 27, neither give place to the devil. Now that's talking about don't give him opportunity. Don't give him a little bitty crack to get his foot in the door. Devil don't need much to get his foot in the door. He's tickled to death. The Bible said he's the power of the air. Now, when the devil is somebody that ought to scare me and you to death, I know he's not the most powerful creature. He's no, he's nowhere close powerful as God. All the power that the devil has is what God allows him to have. Now, the devil, when you study in the Old Testament, the devil was the most beautiful angel that ever been Lucifer was. I mean, he was the most powerful, the most beautiful, but pride took him down. Rose up and wanted to control him and wanted to take it over, and God cast him down and others with him. Let me say the devil's powerful. You better not mess with him. He's dangerous. You let the devil start messing with your mind. You, you ever wondered why some of these people do some of the crazy things we read about in the paper and see on the news? I believe as sure as I'm standing here, these people possessed with the devil tonight. Man, there's wicked stuff. If we can pull this thing back and see what kind of spirit world they are out there, it'd scare us absolutely to death. Man, these demon spirits all around us, and we don't realize that. That's why people are doing the things they're doing. Man, he, he loves to get in these young people's head, get in their minds. Throws all this stuff out there, makes it look good to them. Man, I mean, you, you think about all the devices the devil's got. I mean, music is one thing the devil's got that he uses more than anything in the day and time we're in. Music's a powerful thing. Music's a powerful thing in the church house used in the right way. I mean, man, it, it touches people's hearts when we sing about Jesus, sing about Calvary, sing about how good he's been to us. It'll serve your soul and it'll move you. It'll make you do things that you never thought you'd ever do. And man, there's music out there in the world that controls people. I mean, this rock music, country music, everything coming and going like that. You say, well, I love it. I mean, man, these, these, you don't even find anything that's really like country music anymore out there. There used to be a time that country music sounded different than anything else. It's just about like rock and roll now. You watch all of them that's on there singing, they dress like these rock singers now. I mean, they're all in the same boat. I mean, you got them singing about their liquor. You got them singing about adultery. That's all they're singing about. And we wonder why the devil is using those things to draw people, to get their minds. I mean, music is something that's powerful. And you even start to get into this heavy metal rock stuff. Man, it's dangerous, these groups that are out there. I mean, while well, singing songs, welcoming people to hell and different things, partying there. I mean, these young people need to be preached to. They need to know that's what's out there. I mean, it's a, we're living in a dangerous world right now. The Bible said neither give place to the devil. Either. And you know, it takes courage to walk away from these things. These young people's got so much peer pressure on them anymore. 
Man, they need courage to walk away from their pushed in the thing. Man, we need moms and dads to tell them it'll be all right. They need to be different. The Bible says we're peculiar. We're to be peculiar people. We're to, we're to stand out in the world. We're the folks supposed to know we're saved. Man, you remember a little old boy by the name of David over in the book of 1 Samuel. Chapter 17 over there. You remember how that David had to have some courage? You remember David was a little old shepherd boy out there keeping the sheep. You remember there was a time over there he had to have courage when he killed a lion and a bear. And it wasn't just a few verses on down in that same chapter. He had to have some courage when he stepped up and said this, they're not a cause. You remember they was going into battle with the Philistines. They, they even went and put the armor on David. This is big. He couldn't wear it. He's so small. Remember his brothers and everything was making fun of him. Do you remember there was a giant by the name of Goliath and David went and picked out five smooth stones. Man, all they took was a, those, one of those stones and a sling to put Goliath on his face. Bible talks about when that stone hit him, he fell face first down. You'd think he'd fall backwards, so he had somebody with him to push Goliath over. Man, God put that giant on the ground. So there's a little old boy that had to have some courage when he went into battle. I mean, David was nothing but a shepherd boy. Then became king of Israel, became their leader in battle and everything. But David was just like Moses. He messed up. I mean, you look at David's life. It took a woman to bring the king of Israel down. And after that happened, the sword never left David's house. He committed adultery with Bathsheba. Then the baby died that came out of that adultery sack. Then God never left that sword. It's never left the house of Israel. That's the reason they still fight and everything the way they do now. I mean, with that line of Ishmael and Isaac, I mean, one's a wild man and one was God's man. I mean, we wonder why they fight in the nation of Israel the way they do right now. There'll never be peace over there till the, peace, till the king of peace comes back. The prince of peace. When Jesus comes back, there'll be peace. We, we can send every politician we got over to try to bring peace. Never understood that. We'll put men in the White House claims to be a Christian. We're going to bring peace over there. There'll never be peace till Jesus comes in that land. I mean, that all belongs to them and what they're fighting for. But when the Prince of Peace steps out, their eyes will be opened again. Now he said, you're going to have to have courage, Joshua. Then he goes to verse number 9 Joshua 1. And he said, have I not commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, then he said, be not afraid. Now that word afraid, that's something that, you know, we like to push off a lot of times. Say we're not afraid of anything. We want to be big men. We don't want to be scared of anything. But the Bible said in Psalms 27, 1, the Bible said, the Lord is my light, my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid of? Now he said, Joshua, you can't be afraid. You're going to have to have courage. And you know, fear, I'm afraid, is something that holds a lot of people back from ever going anywhere with God. They're afraid what people's going to say if they try to get in with God. They're afraid. A lot of these young people are afraid what their, what their friends are going to say if they go with God. They've got that fear. And I'm afraid there's a lot of people also afraid if they get in with God, even adults, well, God's going to do something with me. He's going to send me to the mission field. He's going to make a preacher out of me. We're well, to never fear what God's going to do with us. God will make a way anywhere He puts you at. I mean, we, we've got fear. We've got fear a lot of times, though, of giving things up. Let me say, when you get saved, and if you live right, you live clean and holy, there are some things you'll have to give up. When a man, a woman, boy, or girl gets saved, you can't be the same creature you was. The Bible says you're a new creature. Old things are passed away and all things become new. You can't run with the same old crowd. I didn't say you couldn't be friends with these people and you couldn't love them. But there's going to be things you can't run with them any longer. I mean, you can't run to the bars. You can't run here to there like you used to when you get saved. There's a new creature and it's a new path. It's a new direction. You know, we've got fear of having to give things up. We've got fears that God might do something with us. But according to this book, though, man, we ought to not fear anything but God. 
I know there was a while there a few years back people was wearing these shirts all the time, no fear. And they are things in this life we were to teach our children to fear. Man, they are to fear fire. They are to fear a poisonous snake. There were to be things out there that we were to teach them to fear. But there's things in this life that we ought to not be afraid of because we're saved by God's grace. I mean, we've got somebody behind us tonight. We've got the King and King and Lord of Lords to take care of us. You ought to never be afraid to stand up and say, I'm a Christian. You ought to never be afraid to stand up and say, I'm glad God saved me. Man, you ought to never be afraid to do that out in public. It don't matter who's around. You ought to say, I'm glad I'm saved. You know, if you're saved tonight, we're talking about Joshua and them going over into Canaan. I mean, Joshua had to have some good soldiers when they went into Canaan land. You know, we're soldiers in the army of God tonight. You know, the military, if you, if you go into the military, some of these young men that goes in right now, the military wants men that are fearless, that will go into battle, not afraid to fight. You know, that's what God wants out of me and use fearless men, women, boys, and girls to fight. And you know, the United States, man, well, we've got soldiers that ought to have any weapons that they need. And I know they've let our military run down, and I know they don't have half what they need. The West Sounds are going to get a whole lot of it back. We ought to give them boys everything they need when they go into battle. They're protecting us. I mean, we ought to have the greatest military in the world, the greatest weapons. And you know, us as Christians, now I believe we've got some of the greatest weapons that any, that any soldier could have. And these same weapons we've got, these men need them on the battlefield when they're out there fighting. You say, what are they? We've got this old Bible. Man, this is the greatest weapon that we've got. Well, what do you think the Lord used on the devil when he was up on the mountain and the devil tempted him? He used the Word of God on Man, we need to use this Bible daily on the devil. He's afraid of it. You pull this Bible out, he'll get away from you quick as he can. Quote, start quoting Scripture to him. I mean, that's the strongest weapon we've got. I mean, this is what brings salvation. We already mentioned a minute ago, man, we, we've got a weapon in prayer, and that's just simply asking God. And you know, when we ask God, the Bible says you have not because you ask. And I said, asking you shall receive. But, you know, a lot of times we get down and pray, we think God's got to answer right then. God may not be interested in answering that prayer right then. It may be somewhere down the road. We're interested in our time instead of His. You know, I've got to the place in my life, I'm wondering a lot of times some of the best prayers I ever prayed was prayers that God didn't answer. You know, there's some things we'll get down and pray for sometimes probably get us in a big mess if we just stop to think about it. I mean, God is a God that will answer prayers. we got another weapon in praising God. The Bible said everything that has breath or to praise Him. That's just simply thanking God. You know, I've heard folks say, well, I, I, we'll get in, you'll get in a testifying service in a church or something. I've heard folks say, well, I'll get up and testify and God moves on me. I ain't ever found that nowhere in this book. He said everything that has breath is to praise Him. So anytime we get an opportunity, we ought to say, God, I want to thank you for saving me. Thank you for putting a roof over my head, feeding me, clothes on my back, shoes on my feet. But we take those things for granted. We don't realize where they come from most of the time. I mean, you get to praising God. You, you, I mean, we don't realize what it'll do for the church. We don't know what it'll do for our family and community. God wants our praise. We got another weapon that we forget a lot about, probably the most powerful weapon we've got, and that's love. Love will change more things at the house of God than anything else, just loving people. And you know, I, I'm a Baptist, and I, I've been a priest in a lot of churches. You can ask my wife over the last few years. And man, you, you don't see the love around the house of God you used to. We've got more bitterness and more hatred. If you don't do something just like somebody else, they're going to run you off. You don't do something the way they think it ought to be done, they're going to run you off a lot of places. Hey, if it don't line up with this book, they need to junk what they think. And there's a lot of this stuff man-made that's going on in the day and time we're living in. 
I mean, the Bible just talks about love. Man, that love, the Bible talks about love is nothing simply but charity, and that's loving each other. Love will change us. I mean, love will get folks into an altar that are lost. You let them come in and sit down, just love on them. Keep loving them. Man, I've been places folks have come in, they may not look just right. They may not smell just right. And next thing you know, there'll be some hypocrite in the church trying to run them off because they don't think it should be there. Man, let them sit on the pew. Let them sit right there. Let the Holy Ghost get a hold of their heart. And if He don't, they'll either leave or God will take care of them one. Man, you can ask my wife. Hey, it was a few years back where I was pastoring out over there in Burnsville. I, I, I mean, we had a lesbian come into the church. I know what she was right off the bat. Everybody in there did. Folks ready to get rid of them. I said, you leave that girl alone. Let her sit right there. Man, I preached to that girl probably when you had my wife for six months, she kept coming. She didn't go to that altar and water that altar out, but she didn't want to let loose of that scene. She didn't want to let loose of what she was doing. She wasn't willing to tell God he was right and she was wrong. Yet God can save them people, but they got to turn to the other direction. She sat right there. She even got up and came up in the choir one night. Some of them wanted to get a hold of her. And I said, leave her alone. Let's leave her alone. But I, I tell you what, though, when those little old girls went to the bathroom, I sent some woman with them. There wasn't nobody going to follow these little girls around. I tell you what, there's a man or woman touches young in the church or anywhere else, that bunch is sick and there ought to be something done to them. I, I mean, a man or woman is sorry, low down to mess with a little boy or a little old girl. But that old girl, she kept coming and finally, she couldn't take the preaching any longer. She couldn't take it. She, she was under conviction, run to that altar, but would not. And finally, just had to turn away from it and not come back. So you ought to leave them alone. Let them sit there. No, I don't believe what they're doing is right. And I'm not going to go along with them. I, I'm not going to pay them. I'm not going to pay it on them. But if the Word of God don't get a hold of them, nobody else is going to. person's got to be willing to turn and go the other way before they ever get saved. But we've got love. We've got with that changes other people. You know, a soldier usually is, is fearless if they've got a good leader, they can count on. You look there in Joshua chapter 1 and verse number 9. The Bible said, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou smayed. For the Lord for the Lord thy God is with thee, wheresoever thou goest. Joshua had the greatest leader. God said, The Lord thy God is with thee, wheresoever thou goest. Man, Joshua and his soldiers, man, they had the greatest <laughs> captain, the greatest general they could ever have in God. You know, me and you have got the same thing tonight. We've got the same God that Joshua had. And I mean, these are just some simple instructions that he gave Joshua when he crossed over. Told him he just can't be afraid. He's got to have courage. Told him to live this book. Told him to pray. You know, those are simple things that we make out to be hard things. And he said, neither give place to the devil. Can you imagine Joshua, Moses died, him stepping into them shoes, them people looking at him, is he going to be able to do this? Hey, Amen. Joshua took him in, marched around them walls and everything over there because he had God with him. That's all me and you to need, not just God and nothing else. Amen. Been good to be in the Lord's house today. Appreciate everybody coming out. We hope we've been a little bit of help to you today. I want you to pray for us. We'll be praying for you. Anybody got a word on your heart tonight before we pray?